Hi, welcome to Lecture 5.3, covering polynomial functions. Uh, now, this is really an extension of Section 5.2, which was uh, covered on your last test, where we first started looking at power functions, and then we saw how polynomial functions were a specific type of power function. And so we start off this test material by diving in much deeper into um, polynomial functions and uh, how they act on the graph, how we can go about even sketching these graphs. Um, so that's what we will be looking at. Okay, so first, recognizing the characteristics of graphs of polynomial functions. Um, it is important to note about the graphs of polynomial functions that when you graph them, you should not have to pick up your pen or pencil. It, it's continuous. Um, that's the word we use uh, to describe that characteristic of being able to draw it all in in one motion without without picking up your pen. Um, and um, so, if you look at these two examples below the uh, couple of sentences there at the top, the one on the left is a polynomial function. Uh, you can see it's smooth, um, there are no sharp points in it, um, and you can draw the whole thing without picking up your pen. So I'm just demonstrating that. So no sharp points and no breaks, that's, that's your qualification. All right, so if you look at this uh, example on the right, no, this is not a polynomial function. You can see there's a break in the graph right there. So let's look at the bottom and just determine if these are polynomial functions or not. Uh, if we look at this first one, it's smooth, there's no sharp points, it's continuous. Yes, this is a polynomial function. If we look at this next one, we know that this is not a polynomial function because we've already studied this. This is an absolute value function. But notice it comes to a sharp point here. Um, so no, this is not a polynomial function. Uh, this third example, smooth, continuous, yes, it is a polynomial function. Um, this last one, although it is smooth, meaning it has no sharp points, we have a break in our function there, so it is not a polynomial function. Okay, so a quick Q&A here that I thought was important to include in your notes. Do all polynomial functions have as their domain all real numbers? And you'll be pleased to know that yes. The domain of any polynomial function is negative infinity to positive infinity. So all real numbers there. Um, okay, so when we go to graph polynomial functions, one of the first things we end up finding about the polynomial function to put on the graph are what we call the zeros. And zeros are the same thing as x-intercepts. So you get your x-intercepts by plugging in 0 for f of x or y. Um, that's the reason these things are called zeros, because you get them by plugging 0 into um, the function for the output value. You get an output of 0 there. So um, the way we the way we uh, find these x-intercepts, well, one way we can find these x-intercepts 
is to factor the polynomial and then use the zero product property um, to solve for each of those uh, factors that we come up with. So you'll want to get everything equal to zero. So you'll, you'll put your polynomial in standard form. You will plug in zero for, I'm sorry, not f of zero, that's plugging in zero for x, which would give you the y-intercept. Um, you're going to plug in zero for y, or f of x, and then you will factor your polynomial by whatever method possible. You always want to check for a greatest common factor first, and then you use whatever method you have available to you uh, to factor the rest of the polynomial if there's more to be done to it. And then the fourth thing that you do is to um, apply the zero product property. And we learned a lot about that um, in our study of quadratic equations. To find your x-intercept. So this is to find x-intercept. All right. Okay, so, um, and here are the steps. <laughs> Didn't remember that I had included these steps on there, or I wouldn't have written all those out, um, but it doesn't hurt to hear it twice, huh? Okay, so um, just the opposite for finding your y-intercepts. Y-intercepts are actually easier to find than x-intercepts. So if you're looking for a y-intercept, you're going to plug in 0 for x. If you're looking for an x-intercept or intercepts, you're going to plug in 0 for f of x. So um, whatever intercept you're looking for, you plug in 0 for the opposite coordinate, the other coordinate. Okay, so um, all we're asked to do is find the x and y-intercept for this polynomial here. So for the y-intercept, since that's easier, we'll do that first. We're just going to plug in 0 into the function. So z, g, excuse me, of 0 equals 0 minus 2 squared times 2 times 0 plus 3. So that's negative 2 squared times 3. And that's negative 4. No, that is positive 4. That negative gets squared away. Four times three. So I get a y-intercept of 12. Um, that corresponds to the point 0, 12. And I'm only going to have one y-intercept with a function. Remember, you can't have multiple output values of the same value because that is sending, I'm sorry, you can't send more than one input value to the same output value. Mm, scratch that, I said that backwards. Sorry, it's early if you can't tell. It's, it's, I started this at 7 a.m. and I've been up for a while. Um, you cannot send the same input value to more than one output value because that's going to stack points on top of each other and that will fail the vertical line test. So any function is only going to have one y-intercept. All right. Now x-intercepts, you can have you can have as many as uh, that graph happens to cross the x-axis. So for the x-intercepts, we have to plug in 0 for f of x. So we have 0 equals x minus 2 squared times 2x plus 3. Okay, so I'm already in factored form. So I don't have to do any factoring, which is nice. 
I'm ready to apply the zero product property. The zero product property says that if I'm multiplying values that equal zero, then I know that A had to equal zero and or B had to equal zero. Um, that, that makes sense. The only way to multiply and get zero out as your product is to multiply with zero. So at this point, I can say, well, if I'm multiplying these two linear factors and they're equaling zero, well, either x minus 2 had to equal zero or 2x plus 3 had to equal zero. So here I add 2 to both sides and get x is 2. Here I subtract 3 and then divide by 2, negative 3 half. So my x-intercepts are the points 2, 0, and I have another one, negative 3 halves, 0. So just to, just to prove this to you, I'm going to take you out to the graph and show you. Um, let me write down the equation so that I don't have to come back to the whiteboard to get it. Okay, so this is g of x equals x minus 2 squared times 2x plus 3. All right, let's go out to our online graphing calculator, desmos.com, and we'll put this onto the graph so you can see where it crosses the x and the y axes. x minus 2 squared. 2x plus 3. Okay. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay. So you can see my y-intercept right there is at 0, 12, which we found that. I have an x-intercept at negative 1, uh, 1 and 1 half, 1 1.5, which is negative 3 halves, that one. And I have an x-intercept at 2, 0. So we were correct. Okay, for this next one, we're just asked to find x-intercepts. They don't ask us to find the y-intercept, but you could find that easily enough, no problem. But for the sake of room on the screen and time, I'll just find the x-intercepts like they've asked. So whenever I find x-intercepts, I plug in 0 for f of x. So 0 equals x to the 6th minus 3x to the 4th plus 2x squared. So I have a GCF that I can take out. Whenever you have a GCF, always factor that out first and then look to see if you can use any other methods to factor. So when I factor out an x squared, I'm left with x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus 2. Okay, so um, I can use the AC method to factor this. I will also need to use substitution because I don't have a quadratic, but I'm in quadratic form. So if I allow u to equal x squared, I can rewrite this part of my, of my um, function as u squared minus 3u plus 2. And now I can use my AC method. So um, A is 1. 1 times 2 is 2. And I'm looking for what multiplies to make 2, but adds to make negative 3. And that's negative 2 and negative 1. So I'm going to rewrite as 
u squared minus 2u minus 1u plus 2. Now I split it down the center. Take a GCF out of the first two terms, which is u. I'm left over with u minus 2. Take a GCF out of the second two terms. Negative 1. Remember, you always want to put your sign on that second set. And I'm left with u minus 2. So this thing factors as u minus 2 times u minus 1. But u is x squared. Remember? So my factors actually come out to be at 0 equals, I still have my x squared that I factored out earlier, so that sits there. And now I have an x squared minus 2 and an x squared minus 1. Well, as if we haven't done enough work already, this x squared minus 1 is a difference of squares and factors as well. So far, here I am. 0 equals x squared. Then I have an x squared minus 2. And now that x squared minus 1 factors as x plus 1, x minus 1. Okay, so I'm finally ready to apply my zero product property. So I get x squared equals 0, take the square root of both sides, and I just get x is 0 there. Technically, I'd get positive or negative zero, but zero doesn't have a sign, so you don't have to worry about the positive and the negative there. I also have x squared minus 2 equals zero. Add 2 to both sides, so x squared is 2. Take the square root of both sides. x is equal to the positive and negative square root of 2. Then I have x plus 1 equals 0, x minus 1 equals 0, oh, I got it to fit, x equals negative 1, and x equals positive 1. So I've got four zeros for this particular polynomial. I've got a 0 of 0, no, I'm sorry, I've got 5. I've got the positive square root of 2, the negative square root of 2, I've got positive 1 and negative 1. Since this one's so interesting, um, I think it would be beneficial to take a look at this one as well. So let me write it down. f of x equals x to the 6 minus 3x to the 4th plus 2x squared. Let's take a look. Okay. X to the 6 minus 3x to the 4th plus 2x squared. All right, let me zoom in on the important part. Okay, so you can see I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 x-intercepts, and negative 1.4140, that is the negative square root of 2. And then I have a negative 1, a 0, a 1, and a positive square root of 2. So, um, pretty cool, huh? At least in my nerdy world, things like this are cool.
Okay, find the x and y intercepts. So same thing here. We'll start with the y intercepts since those are quite simple to find. So for the y intercept, you're going to plug in 0 for x. So f of 0 equals 0 to the fourth minus 19 times 0 squared plus 30 times 0. 0 minus 0 plus 0 is 0. Now, note that since we have a y-intercept of 0, 0, we should expect 0 to show up as an x-intercept as well. Whenever you have the origin as a y-intercept, you have to have it as an x-intercept uh, also because it, that's where the two axes meet. So they have that point in common. Okay, let's look for the x-intercept by plugging in 0 for f of x. So 0 equals x to the fourth minus 19x squared plus 30x. All right, so what we can do, this one's a little bit different. What we can do here is factor out a GCF of x. And that leaves us with x cubed minus 19x plus 30. However, this thing doesn't factor. And it's not a quadratic that I can run through the quadratic formula to solve for. It's a cubic. So I'm actually going to need to default to just using my graph. Graph it to find my x-intercept. So let me write it down. I have f of x equals x to the fourth minus 19x squared plus 30x. Okay, let's go take a look. Let's get a new color. I'm over the over the red. Okay. Let's see. X to the four minus nineteen x squared plus thirty x. All right. So let's out. There's a lot more of the graph that we wouldn't have seen if we didn't zoom out. Okay, so I have an x-intercept of negative 5. There's the 0, 0 that we knew we were going to see. Then I have 2, 0 and 3, 0. So I have x-intercepts of negative 5, 0, two, and three. I'm just traveling back to the whiteboard now. Okay, so I have x-intercepts of negative five, zero, two, and three. All right. Okay, so zeros and their multiplicity. So here's a new word. Multiplicity. The number of times a given factor appears in the factored form of the equation of the polynomial is called the multiplicity. Let's go back and let me show you something. Okay, look right here at this function. Because the factor x minus 2 is squared, 
that means it shows up twice, that factor has a multiplicity of 2. The next factor, 2x plus 3, is raised to the understood first power. That factor has a multiplicity of 1. So multiplicity is just how many times the factors show up as factors within the polynomial. And it gives us important information about the graph. If you have a multiplicity equal to 1, we call this a complete cross. Just like a line, it's just going to, where, wherever that 0 is, it's going to just cross over the x-axis there. If you have an even multiplicity, the most basic one being 2, you do what we call touch and turn at that, multi at that 0. So this looks like it had a 0 of the origin and it came down, it touched zero, and then it turned the opposite way. And then finally, if you have odd multiplicity greater than one, so three, five, seven, and so on, it does what we call S's across. Just like the cubic, it comes in and it does this S across and then goes off. So um, you can see all that described at the bottom in words. Um, one thing to note is that the higher the multiplicity, the um, flatter that it's going to appear in both the even multiplicity and the higher odd numbers. So um, let's say we had something that was like x to the 8. It would come in and it's going gonna, it's gonna to really look like it flattens out almost. At the, it, it's not completely flat. It's still decreasing. But then it hits zero and it comes nice and wide and flat here. So that's what they mean by flatter. And, and if we have an odd multiplicity, it may look something like this. It's going to come and then it's going to go very flat and then up. Okay, so graphical behavior, um, this is just describing what I just talked about with the multiplicities. Um, so how to, um, that, that last box describes, okay, if you're given the graph of a polynomial, how can you work backwards and write the equation of that polynomial from the graph? Well, the first thing you're going to do is figure out where the graph crosses the x-axis because that's going to give you your linear factors that you're multiplying together. Um, and then you have to look at its multiplicity. If it touches and turns, they call this bounces off in this textbook. If it touches and turns, you know you're going to have an even multiplicity. If it um, if it completely crosses, that's just going to be raised to the first power. If it S's across, that's going to have an odd multiplicity higher than 1. The sum of the multiplicities is in. Okay, so let's take a look at 1 or 2. All right, so the first thing I want to note is where are my x-intercepts? I have an x-intercept at negative 3, at negative 1, and at 4. Okay, so let me remind you that when you found these zeros, 
let's say you had the linear factor x plus 3 equals 0. You had to subtract 3 from both sides to get a 0 of negative 3. So whatever sign your 0 is, don't forget you need the opposite sign when you create the linear factor. Here's what I mean. So far, I know my function has three linear factors because I've got three zeros. And I know they all start with x. My linear factor of negative three had to come from I'm sorry, my, my zero of negative three had to come from the linear factor x plus three. That's how it became negative three there. My zero of negative one came from x plus one. And my zero of four came from x minus four. All right, now I need to decide, okay, what multiplicity am I going to assign to each of these? Well, I need to look how they cross the x-axis. This 0 of negative 3 is a touch and turn. Doesn't look very fat. I'm assuming that is squared. And then at negative 1, I completely cross. That is understood to be raised to the first power. Now, we would not write that, but it's understood to be that. And then at my, uh, at my zero of positive four, I S across. So that must have been a cubed factor. So when writing when writing this out, it would be X plus three squared times X plus one times x minus 4 cubed. Now, I've had students in the past ask, does it matter what order I write the factors in? And the answer is no. Um, multiplication, which is what you're doing with those factors, multiplication is commutative. In other words, 2 times 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2. So x plus 3 squared times x plus 1 times x minus 4 cubed is the same thing as x minus 4 cubed times x plus 3 squared times x plus 1. You can flip-flop those factors any way you want to, and it means the same thing. Okay, let's take a look at this next one. First thing I'm going to point out are the x-intercepts, the zeros. I have a 0 at negative 5 a 0 at negative 1, and a 0 at 3. Okay, so, so far I know that f of x is equal to, let me give myself room for linear factors here. Got three of them. And they all start with x. In case I have a linear factor of, I'm sorry, a, a 0 of negative 5, which came from x plus 5. Negative 1 came from x plus 1, and 3 came from x minus 3. Now we need to decide, okay, how are these things crossing the x-axis? So this first one, simply s is across. I would say that's cubic. The second one touches and turns. I would say that's squared. Now, this last one also touches in terms, but notice it's pretty fat. I would say that's at least an even raised to the fourth power, at least. You're going to have varying answers on these. I could have I could have said that that's raised to the eighth power. Um, and I do believe that WebAssign uh, will accept any of the correct answers. I think it's programmed that if I had said that that last factor x minus 3 was raised to the 8th power, that it would take that because it's greater than 2. And that shows that I recognize that it was, um, sorry, I lost my earbuds. 
and microphone for a moment because I'm trying to plug my I'm trying to plug my computer up. It's about to die on me, and I don't want to stop the recording. Last time I stopped the recording and restarted it, an hour and a half lecture uh, didn't record. There was a problem with the program. And actually, it was this lecture <laughs> that I stopped it on, and I lost the entire thing. So I'm having to re-record it this morning, which is my favorite thing to do is lose an hour and a half worth of work. Anyway, back to our polynomial here. Um, I'm going to call it to the fourth, but like I said, I believe WebAssign will accept multiple possibilities on that. And if it doesn't and it's actually correct, then just shoot me a message and I'll go take a look at it and give you credit for it if it is actually correct. Okay, determining end behavior. Now, we've already talked about end behavior with um, power functions, and um, there's no difference with polynomial functions. You're going to be focusing on the leading term of the polynomial function to try to determine what type of end behavior it has. So we have the possibility of being a positive or a negative term. So we have to take into consideration the sign of the leading term. And then we have the possibility of either being an even degree or an odd degree. So we take the sign and the even or oddness of the degree into consideration to decide, okay, how are the tail ends of um, this function going to act? So we only have to know two different functions to be able to remember how the tail ends are going to act. So we have our linear function, which is f of x equals x to the understood first power. So we have the positive linear identity, and we have the negative negative x to the understood first power, linear identity. So if I were graphing these, it would just be a line going straight through. Notice I fall to the left and I rise to the right. That's going to be the same for any, this is, an, this is a positive odd. Positive is my sign, odd is my degree. This is a positive odd. It's going to fall left and rise right. In other words, it is going to, as, as x moves into negative infinity, f of x moves into negative infinity as well. And as x moves into positive infinity, f of x moves into positive infinity as well. Okay, let's look at negative identity. Um, as x moves into negative infinity, f of x actually moves into positive infinity. As x moves into positive infinity, f of x moves into negative infinity. We usually call this rise left, fall right, just to make it a little easier to say. And now we have the most basic even degreed function, and that is the quadratic. So we can think of our positive quadratic and I call that tails up, but what that basically means is that as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity. As x approaches positive infinity, f of x also approaches positive infinity. So tails up. So this is a positive even. Oops, I forgot to label my negative odd. 
negative. That's the sign. Odd. And then finally, we've got the negative quadratic. So f of x equals negative x squared. And then I call this tail down because it's reflected. So as x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity. As x approaches positive infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity. So this is a negative even. All right. So um, <clears throat> understanding the relationship between degree and turning point. So this is just going to open up a little bit more food for thought um, before we go start putting these things onto the graph. Um, and what we find out here is that um, when we have a polynomial of degree n, in this case, this polynomial off to the left-hand side has a degree of 4. What we know about polynomial functions is that it's going to have at most n minus 1 turning point. So look here. I have a degree of 4. I have a turning point here. I have a turning point here. And I have a turning point here. That's three turning points. My degree was 4. So n minus 1 in this case is 4 minus 1, which is 3. Now, I don't have to have 3. But I can't have any more than 3. It says at most I can have n minus 1 turning point. And turning points are where it just changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, decreasing to increasing. Okay, find the maximum number of turning points for each of the polynomial functions. Sometimes it's not written in standard form for you, and you have to identify, okay, what's my leading term, because I need to know what my degree is. In the case of A, my degree is 5, so I can have at most, at most, in minus 1 turning point, which in this case is 5 minus 1 or 4 turning point. Okay, here's B. Now, with B, it's a little trickier because your leading term is hidden. Uh, it's hidden because this thing's already factored. So I have a negative out front. I know my leading term is going to be negative. And then this x in this first term is going to get squared. So I know I have an x squared that's going to multiply to make that leading term. And then I have a 2x squared as my leading term of my last factor. So when I multiply all that together, I get a negative 2x to the 4th as my leading term there. So um, this is con uh, this is considered a negative even. We could talk about the end behavior there if we wanted to. Um, but it's asking about turning point. So it has at most n minus 1 turning points. In this case, n is 4. So it has 4 minus 1 or 3 turning points at most. Okay. So we're actually moving on to graphing these things. Let me take a sip of coffee. First thing you want to do is find the intercept. That is x-intercept, where f of x is equal to 0, and the y-intercept, where f of 0 is um, evaluated. Um, I don't usually check for symmetry when I'm graphing or sketching graphs of polynomial functions. Sometimes it can be helpful, um, but 
Other times, it's just more work that doesn't really get you anywhere. You can check for symmetry, and by all means, if WebAssign asks you to, you're going to have to. So to, to just to remind you about symmetry, we studied this uh, during the first test when we were studying general characteristics of um, functions, just functions in general, any functions. When you plug in negative x into a function, if none of your signs change and you get out the same function you started with, this is going to have y-axis symmetry. If you plug in negative x to your function and all of the signs change, so you get the opposite polynomial, then this is going to have origin symmetry. If some signs change and some don't, then you've got neither. And like I said, this step is not even included in the last textbook that we used for this course, but it's good information to know and it's good to remind you of what even in odd functions are and, and how that relates to symmetry. Um, but if you're just sketching this graph on your own, I probably would not do this step here just for the sake of time. Okay, um, use the multiplicities of the zeros to determine the behavior at your x-intercept. Um, determine the tail end behavior using your leading term, and then you can start putting things onto your graph. It's really not that difficult. It sounds scary, but it's not bad. So, here we go. All right, so we want to start out by finding our intercepts. We'll start with our y-intercept since that one's the easiest, and that is when you plug in 0 for x. So f of 0 is equal to negative 2 times 0 plus 3 squared times 0 minus 5. So this is negative 2. 3 squared is 9 times negative 5. So negative 45 times negative 2 is positive 90. So I have a y-intercept, let me get a different color here, a y-intercept of 0, 90. And I can go ahead and put that onto the graph. That's right here. All right, let's find x-intercepts. So we're lucky with the x-intercepts because this is already factored for us. So this is when you plug in 0 for f of x. So 0 equals negative 2 times x plus 3 squared times x minus 5. Okay, negative 2 does not equal 0, so you don't have to worry about that um, constant factor that's out front. Then we have x plus 3 equals 0, x minus 5 equals 0, so x equals negative 3, and x equals 5. These correspond to the points negative 3, 0, and 5, 0. So I have an x-intercept at negative 3. Oops, and I cut the graph off too short. I have one at positive 5 as well. And we can also gather the behavior at those zeros. This x plus 3 factor is squared. So this has a multiplicity of 2, which means touch and turn. And then this x minus 5 factor has a multiplicity of 1, so it completely crosses there. 
Um, and we'll put that onto the graph once we determine the end behavior, which is what we're about to do. So these are the tail ends we're talking about here. And we get that from looking at the leading term. So let me point out what your leading term is going to be made of. We have this factor out front for the leading term is made up of a negative 2 times an x squared times an x. So our leading term is negative 2x cubed. This is a negative odd, so we should expect rises left, falls right, just like the negative line. So I know that this thing's going to rise to the left and fall to the right. I also know that at negative 3, this thing touches and turns. Now, I don't know if I peek out before I go through the x-axis, I'm sorry, the y-axis, or if I go through the y-axis and then peek out. So um, you would need to go to your graph to figure that out. And when I, I'll just take you out to graph it. Let me write it down so I don't forget the equation. f of x equals negative 2 times x plus 3 squared times x minus 5. Okay. Let's go see what happens with that um, maximum. Okay. Negative 2 times x plus 3 squared times x minus 5. Now, there is a way to calculate your maximums and your minima, your maxima and your minima, but that's calculus. So you won't know that until you get into calculus. Okay, we can see from this graph, let me spread this x-axis out a little bit because we don't need to see this much of the x-axis. Let's go from negative 5 to 5. Okay. Okay, so you can see this thing swoops down. It goes through the y-axis at 90, and then it peaks out at 2.33, so 2 and a third, 151.7. I'm going to write that point down because you've got to use your graphing calculators to calculate the maxima and the minima on these things, so I'm going to write this down. Now this particular this particular problem didn't ask us about this, but it's good to practice because you will be asking your homework. So we've got our x intercepts there and we were correct about that. Okay, so Coming back here, so now what we know is that the graph of this function goes through the y-axis, and then at about 2.33, which is about right here, it peaks out at 151, so about right there. And then it comes down, 
And then we have our multiplicity of one, so it just completely crosses right through that zero. And that's how you graph those. That's it. They're really not that bad. Um, I'll just note that this point is the point 2.333. 151.704. All right. That's how you graph. Notice I didn't need to do the symmetry to graph this thing. Um, and, and I hate to encourage you not to do more work, but, you know, there's something to be said about efficiency as well. It is not necessary to have that symmetry. Okay, so another characteristic of polynomial functions is that we can determine if there is a, an x-intercept or zero located between two x values. And the way we do that is basically using common sense. But that common sense has been given a name called the Intermediate Value Theorem. Okay, what the Intermediate Value Theorem says is, if I plug an x value in, we'll say this is an x value of 2 that gives me this point right here. So, f of 2 comes out to be, looks like negative 3 to me. And then say I run down the x-axis a little further and plug in uh, 4. And I plug in 4. It looks like my function, let's see, my function is going to keep on going like this. It looks like that function evaluates at about, mm, Eight maybe. Let's see. F of four equal to eight. Okay. So what the intermediate value theorem tells you is that when you plug in some x value a, they're calling that a, and some x value b, if your signs changed when you evaluated at those values, you had to cross over the x-axis. So basically, you're going from an output value of one sign to an output value of the other sign, which means you had to cross over the x-axis. That's why I say this is kind of just common sense. All right, so um, show that the function f of x equals 7x to the 5th minus 9x to the 4th minus x squared has at least one real zero between an x value of 1 and an x value of 2. Well, you just need to evaluate the function at both of those values and see if they are opposite signs, because if they're opposite signs, it had to cross over the x-axis. So f of 1 equal to 7 times 1 to the 5th minus 9 times 1 to the 4th minus 1 squared. So this is 7 times 1, which is 7. Negative 9 times 1, which is negative 9. And negative 1 squared is minus 1. So negative 10 plus 7 is negative 3. And I am probably going to need to grab my, I don't think I need to grab my calculator. Let's see, f of 2. 7 times 2 to the 5th minus 9 times 2 to the 4th minus 2 squared. 2 to the 5th is 32. Yeah, I'm going to need to get my calculator. So this is 7 times 32 minus 9 times 16 minus 4. Give me two seconds. It's right here. Okay, so 7 times 32 minus 9 times 16 minus 4. And I get 
positive 76. Notice this one has a negative sign. This one has a positive. So um, we have shown, because of the intermediate value theorem, that at least one real zero exists between an x value of 1 and an x value of 2. Okay, so with this one it says show at least two real zeros live between an x value of 1 and an x value of 4. Let's go get a picture of this um, of this function just so this is get, so this will make a little more sense to you. So I'm writing it down. F of x is equal to x cubed minus 5x squared plus 3x plus 6. Okay. So x cubed minus 5x squared plus 3x plus 6. Okay, so we're trying to show, let me spread this out a little bit, the y axis. Let's see from negative 10 to 10. Okay. That's more true to the shape there. All right. Let me grab the part we want to work with. And now we'll go back to our whiteboard and we'll show algebraically that this thing has two zeros between those values. Okay, there's our graph. All right, so they're asking us to plug in an x value of 1 and an x value of 4 to show that there are two zeros between those. So what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to plug in 1 and we're going to have to plug in 2, I'm sorry, plug in 4. But then we need to plug in another x value between there. So I'm going to choose 3. What I should expect to see is a positive output at x equals 1, a negative output at x equals 3, and a positive output at x equals 4. So let's do that. f of 1 is 1 cubed minus 5 times 1 squared plus 3 times 1 plus 6. So 1 uh, minus 5 plus 3 plus 6 is negative 4 plus 3, which is negative 1. Negative 1 plus 6 is positive 5. And notice we got an output of positive 5 there. Okay, so um, then now I'm going to go ahead and plug in f of 4 and show you how this is going to clue you in that you need to choose another value to plug in. When I plug 4 in, 
what's going to happen is I'm going to end up with another positive value. So, okay, and that's 4 cubed. 4 cubed is 64 um, minus 16 times 5, I think, is 80 off the top of my head, but I'm going to check because it's early still. Yep, 80 plus 3 plus. So 64 plus 80, no, minus 80, minus 80 plus 3 plus 6, oops, I have done my math incorrectly. <laughs> what have I made a mistake with? Four cubed is sixty four. Four squared sixteen times five is oh, I plugged in one there. Goodness. That should be a four, which makes that twelve. Okay, now. 64 minus 80 plus 12 plus 6. Okay, that gives me an output value of 2. Okay, so notice that both of these output values are positive. So if I just did the intermediate value theorem, I would say, no, there are no zeros between here. But we're, it's saying, okay, show that there are at least two real zeros. So because these are both positive, I have to choose that third value between 1 and 4 that yields a negative result. So I can see that I crossed over the x-axis. And the one I'm choosing to plug in is an f of 3. So we should expect a negative value to come out. 3 cubed minus 5 times 3 squared plus 3 times 3 plus 6. So 3 cubed is 27. Uh, 3 squared is 9 times negative 5 is negative 45 plus 9 plus 6. And 27 minus 45 plus 9 plus 6 equals negative 3. So since f of, since the value 3 is between 1 and 4, and I've changed signs there, that means that I had to cross over the x-axis twice to get back to that positive value. So I crossed here and here. Okay, so... Um, Factored form of polynomials. If the polynomial of lowest degree P has horizontal intercepts, so these are the X intercepts it's talking about, X sub 1, X sub 2, X sub 3, and so on and so on. That's just a naming system. All this is saying is the polynomial can be written in the factored form A, which is your stretch or compressed factor times, those are all your linear factors that they're, they're listing out there. So this is just the general way of writing that. If you're given the graph of a polynomial function, you can write the formula for it. You do just like we did a moment ago. But a moment ago, we didn't take into consideration the stretch factor that could be there, so that A value. So what you're going to do is use your x-intercepts to write your linear factors, use how it crosses the graph to write the multiplicity of those factors, and then you use one point from the graph that you know to plug in for x and f of x and solve for your stretch factor, A. So let's do that. Okay, so I'm given the graph here. First thing I'm going to do, oops, first thing I'm going to do is identify my x-intercepts. I have an x-intercept of negative 3, 2, and 5. 
so far, here's what I know. I know that my function may have some stretch factor A that I don't know yet. But what I do know is that I have linear factors of x plus 3. It completely crosses at that 0, so I'm going to leave that as a multiplicity of understood 1. I have a linear factor of x minus 2, and I'm going to square that because that's a touch and turn. And then I have a linear factor of x minus 5. It's a completely cross, so I'm going to leave that as an understood one. So I already know my linear factors. Now I need to figure out, okay, what is that stretch factor? So what you do is you choose any point that exists on the function, and I'm going to use my y-intercept. You don't have to use the y-intercept, but that point is just nice and neat. It puts a zero in there, and um, makes things easy on me. So this is the point 0, negative 2. I'm going to plug in for x and f of x using that point. And then all I'll have left that's a variable is my stretch factor, and that's what I'll solve for. So negative 2 is equal to some stretch factor a times x plus 3, x minus 2 squared, x minus 5. Okay, I'm going to plug in my x's, which are zeros. There we go. And then I still have this stretch factor a that I'm going to solve for now. Okay, so negative 2 equals a times 3 times 4 times negative 5, and 12 times negative 5 is negative 60. So negative 2 equals negative 60a. And then I divide both sides by negative 60. I'm going to come up over here. So now I know. My stretch factor is equal to 1 30th. I just divided that common factor of negative 2 out of both of those. 1 30th. So I'm ready to write my polynomial. f of x equal to 1 30th times x plus 3 times x minus 2 squared times x minus 5. All right, same thing for the next one. Let me just a little barrier here. First thing I'm going to do is identify my x-intercepts. I have a negative 1, a 2, and a 4. So far, here's what I know. f of x is equal to some stretch factor A times my linear factors x plus 1, I'm going to square that because it's a touch and turn, times x minus 2. I would say that that's greater than cubed because it's pretty flat. I'm going to make this to the fifth. Times x minus 4, it completely crosses, so I leave that as understood 1. Now I choose my one other point to plug in, and I'm going to use the y-intercept again, 0, negative 4. So I have negative 4 equals some stretch factor A times oops, I don't want X. I'm going to plug in for X.
Okay, so this is plus 1, minus 2, and minus 4. And those x values are 0. All right. So negative 4 equals a times 1 squared is 1. Negative 2 to the fifth is negative 32 uh, times negative 4. All right. So 32 times 4 is 128. Negative 4 equals 128a. I divide both sides by 128. Um, let's see, 128 divided by 4, 32, so we get that A is equal to negative 130 seconds. All right, so my function is F of X equals negative 130 seconds times X plus 1 squared, x minus 2 to the fifth, and x minus 4. All right, local and global extrema. These are just maxes and mins here. A local is one that exists. A global is either the highest or the lowest. That's the only difference between local and global. Do all polynomial functions have a global minimum or maximum? No. Okay. So an open top box is to be constructed by cutting out squares from each corner of a 14 by 20 centimeter sheet of plastic. So um, they're telling us that the sizes of the squares to be cut out are W by W. So if I cut these out, I can write expressions for the length and the width of the whole box. My length is 20 total, but I'm cutting out, let me get a different color here to show you this. I'm cutting out one length of W here and one length of W there. So my full length can be written as 20 minus 2W because I'm taking those two lengths of W off. And then if you look at the width, I'm also cutting off a W here and a W here. So my width can be written as 14 minus 2W. Now, if you think about this, if I folded those tabs up, the height of my box would equal W. And the reason I need to know that is because they ask us, what's the maximum volume that can be enclosed by the box? So when we're talking about maximum, we're looking for a global maximum to answer this question. So every point, in this plane is going to be of the form WV for volume. And the volume of a rectangular of a rectangular solid or prism is volume equals length times width times height. So in this case, the volume of my box top equals We'll start with my height, which is W, times my length, 20 minus 2W, times my width, 14 minus 2W. All right, so I need to multiply this out to get my polynomial. 
Actually, no, I don't. We can go to the graph and get this information. Let's do that. Go to the graph. So let me write down our function. f of x equals x times 20 minus 2x times 14 minus 2x. Okay, so x times 20 minus 2x times 14 minus 2x. Okay, let me zoom out. Whoa, whoa. Okay, so let's spread the x-axis out a little bit so we can get a clearer picture. Looks like we only need to go from like, we'll go from negative 5 to 5. Okay. All right. So, if we are wanting to maximize the uh, volume of the box top. We need to find this maximum point here. Let's see. 339. Looks like I hit it. I think anything goes above that. Yeah. So that is the point. 2.7339.03. I'm going to use my graphing calculator to actually calculate that point. In your homework and web assign, there are instructions on how to do this, but I will just talk you through as I'm putting it into my own calculator. So I go to y equals, and I put in my function, x times 20 minus 2x times 14 minus 2x, and I go to my graph, I click my graph button, and um, I'm going to zoom fit this, this is a strange graph, it's very, very tall. Okay, so um, I now need to Go to my calculate menu, which is second, and trace. And the, and the um, fourth one down is a maximum. I'm going to calculate a maximum. It asks for a left boundary. So I arrow over and then hit enter. And then I keep arrowing over to a right boundary and hit enter. And then it asks me to guess. I don't care to guess. I just hit enter. And um, actually, I'm getting the same exact thing that I have on my screen here with my Desmos calculator. I am showing a, uh, an x value of 2.7. And at 2.7, my maximum volume is 339.01. So let's go back. Okay, so what this says is at a W value of approximately 2.7, I will get a max volume of 339 uh, cubic centimeters. Okay, so find the size of the squares that should be cut out to maximize the volume. The size of the squares should be 2.7 by 2.7. Uh, 
Uh, now, if they're wanting the area of those squares to be cut out, then you just multiply those together. I'm not sure what they're asking. If they just want the W length or if they want the area. But 2.7 times 2.7 is 7.29. This is 7.29 square centimeters. Should be cut out on each corner. Okay, and the last one we have here, this is the last slide, last problem. Sorry this lecture went so long. Use technology to find the maximum and minimum values on the interval between negative 1 and 4 of this function. Let me write the function down and we'll go out to our Desmos calculator for the last time here. Uh, negative 0 0.2 times x minus 2 cubed times x plus 1 squared times x minus 4. I'm going to share my desktop. All right. Negative 0 0.2 times x minus 2 cubed times x plus 1 squared times x minus 4. Okay. So we want to know the maximum value. I'm actually going to spread this y axis this out a little bit so we can get a better picture. Looks like we only need to see from about negative 10 to 10, I think. Ooh, we may need to, okay, yeah, nice graph there. That's an interesting graph. Okay, so they want to know about a global maximum between an x value of negative 1 and an x value of 4. Obviously, our global maximum is right here. And they give us the exact values of that, which is 3.573 and 6.951. And that's it. That's uh, If I went back to the whiteboard, that's what I'd write down as the answer for this question. So the global max between those x values, if they are asking what the maximum is, that's the y value. The global max lives at 6. 0.951. The entire point, though, is 3.573, 6.951. The x value answers the where. Where does this occur? And the y value answers the what. What is the global maximum there? I hope this was a helpful uh, lecture for you, and uh, good luck graphing your polynomials.